what is schizophrenia um, from your research and from your general understanding and what is the full landscape of suffering and uh, wisdom that schizophrenia explores? Schizophrenia is a state where there is a break from reality. Uh, and so this can show up as we call them the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. These include hallucinations, hearing something or seeing something that's not there, usually auditory hallucinations. Paranoia, people can have complex fears. Delusions, which we call fixed false beliefs. People get an extremely unshakable but completely implausible idea about something. Sometimes it relates to themselves, sometimes to the world. These we call the positive symptoms, break from reality as we know it. Then there are the negative symptoms that come with it, and these are progressive. These are uh, flattening of, of emotion, as we call it, so starting to express less and less positive emotion, ending more in a, a neutral or flat state. Thought disorder, inability to work with complex patterns of planning or thinking, so you can't make plans, you'd have poor working memory, you can't keep track of where you were in a conversation, in a sequence of actions. So poor and impaired working with the thoughts of oneself and then these these positive symptoms of break from reality. Okay, now why does why does this why do these come together? What's the neurobiology of it? Again, we don't know. Schizophrenia extremely genetically determined. If you look at the numbers could be upwards of 80% genetically determined. Oh, wow. Um 1% of the human population around the world, it's its universal, okay? It's not confined to any one culture, not even really biased in one, you know, uh, culture or another, about 1% around the world. And has this progressive quality to it, untreated, so it, it's very interesting. There's a break that happens. We call it first break uh, when someone experiences their first disruption of reality. They can have a completely typical life up until that point. So you might have a, and I've seen, you know, just heartbreaking cases of like this, like this in the, the Stanford emergency room where a kid who's come there has been extremely, you know, high functioning in that sense of academic achievement and athletic and interpersonal, and then comes to college. Usually in men, it's, it's around 18, 19 when the first break happens. Some terrifying paranoia hits or some auditory hallucinations start, they're getting screamed at by a voice in their head. So devastating. With women, comes on also often a little later, sometimes in the 20s. And it can be progressive. If it's not treated, it just progresses and progresses. The, the voices become overwhelming. The delusions and paranoia extend and expand. The thought, the negative symptoms particularly become more and more severe. So one can't even uh, maintain thoughts in any sort of ordered fashion. Um, and then eventually, uh, you know, it can be fatal, it can lead to suicide, it can lead to erratic behavior that leads to accidents. Um, now, it can be treated. Uh, there are medications that help, uh, uh, fortunately. They have side effects, so they're not perfect. You can have movement problems and... Uh, actually a whole host of different side effects that come from the medications, but we can help people now with, with schizophrenia very, very significantly. Um, but the amazing thing, and this is emblematic of where psychiatry stands, we don't have the deep understanding, just like with depression, we don't have that heart as a pump level of understanding that we'd like to have uh, with schizophrenia, despite it being so biological, so genetic in, in its nature. So is there a way once a way to return to the other side of the first break. So when you have a break with reality, is there a way to kind of stitch it together? Yeah. So some people, that, that works. Uh, but we don't really know how. So medications, antipsychotic medications, we call them, they block a particular neurotransmitter receptor called the uh, serotonin uh, 2A receptor. And they modulate dopamine as well and uh, other neurotransmitters. Um, these can take someone who's actively hallucinating, actively paranoid, put them back in a completely normal state, and some people stay that way 
indefinitely. And so you can bring people back from, from that back to the other side, have it stitched together. More typically, um, you'll end up in some intermediate state where there's a, symptoms are reduced powerfully, but there might be still something there and you've got a, a drop down in, in functioning that may be persistent for a while. But concepts, what physically is going on? One idea is that it's communication within the brain. One part of the brain is not able to tell other parts of the brain what it's doing. And so the auditory hallucinations are very interesting in this regard. They often have this conversational inner monologue-like quality. As we're walking along the street, we may have an inner monologue, thoughts about what's going on. If we see somebody we don't like, we may have a thought, oh, I wish somebody would punch that guy, something like that, or maybe I should punch that guy. But we these are so far below where we would ever you know, act or even think of acting, but they're just things that come up. And, and in people with schizophrenia, those inner thoughts, that inner monologue is not recognized as the inner monologue of the self. And so it's, it's perceived as something coming from the outside uh, or from inside, but from a, another entity. Uh, another, not oh, the self. another, I thought you meant like a, another room yeah, inside uh, the same building. <laughs> another room in the, <laughs> inside the there. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that's, so it's a, it's a, it could be conceptualized as a, communication within the brain problem, notifying what's another part of the brain, what's going on. And there's some evidence uh, consistent with that. I don't know if you can help with this, but I sometimes, so I've been talking to quite a few homeless folks recently, just that's what I do is I <laughs> hang out at night um, and uh, talk to interesting people. And some of them, and I've known people in the past who suffer from schizophrenia and some of them like self, will describe uh as as a as that as something they suffer from and they seem to understand something deeply about this world i don't know if it's correlated or or maybe it's it's another aspect of like depression all those things that i've encountered in my own life is maybe just the struggle and the suffering has taken you through a life where you think deeply about life like there's like self-reflection mm. that society forces on you mm -hmm. because it's a disorder somehow uh, of some kind. It's interesting. Uh, I I guess my only sort of anecdotal observation is people who suffer from schizophrenia seem to be very interesting and very thoughtful in a non-linear way about the world. I've noticed that it's not always positive. Uh, their the unusual ways they view the world it was but it's always interesting it's a, that could be conspiratorial thinking too yeah, yeah like but like the the theories they have about the way the world functions it often very well read which is also interesting because they're almost like looking for helpful answers yes, from are. somewhere yeah, absolutely there and so they're you know they might be citing some very interesting literature and then using that to um uh, there's a stickiness in their mind to different models of the world and trying to make sense of that world. Yes. And those models could include conspiracy theories. Yeah. They're very attuned to complexity and they come up with unlikely explanations, uh, which is one of the things that makes them, it makes it hard for them to function in the, in the world is, is how unlikely their explanations are. But, but you're right. There's a depth of consideration of the complexity of the world and a concern about it and a, a work, uh, a, a, an impulse to work to understand it that is actually quite refreshing. Um, but, you know, the first case in the medical literature, uh, there was a the classical schizophrenia. There was a patient named uh, James Tilly Matthews who ha had this, uh, he sketched out for his doctor the uh, experiences he was, he was uh, sensing. And he, he drew himself as a, a cowering figure on the ground controlled by a loom, a weaving device that was sending threads, long threads, projections across space from the loom to him, to his arms and to his body and controlling him from afar. Uh, and he called this the air loom, a loom in the air. And 
it was such an evocative thing because you know this was the start of the industrial revolution or, or mid and it was where you know really industrial strength you know looms and weaving devices were really uh kind of the emblematic of the most complex powerful technological achievements of the time and so that was the explanation available to him to explain how his body was seemingly moved without his volition uh and these days, of course, people with schizophrenia will have more technology-appropriate interpretations. They'll have a, you know, delusions of satellite or alien control or or beamed information. Very, very common to have this delusion of a government agency, you know, sending electromagnetic or or, or radio frequency information to control their limbs. But it's this it's the same thing. It's that whether it's a thread from an industrial revolution loom or you know, RF, you know, radiation, it's the same thing, just adapted to the to the moment, explaining, trying to explain the world they live in and their relationship to the world. But unconstrained by sort of the thing that's socially acceptable, which right. is that's right. both refreshing and dangerous. Yes. 